Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Jonathan Bricker. I'm at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in the University of Washington. I'm going to be talking about a quitline randomized trial of acceptance and commitment therapy for depressed smokers. I'd like to thank our collaborators who are listed here and also our funding sources who are listed here. Smoking cessation quit lines are available in all 50 states. They are accessible because 95% of people have a telephone. They're cost effective, they're relatively brief, uh, the total intervention time is about up to 90 minutes, and many demographics make use of them, including harder to reach populations like minorities and low income people. Regarding depressed smokers, it turns out that depressed smokers do make use of quit lines. In fact, about 125 to 195,000 depressed smokers are using the quit lines every single year in the U.S. alone. That translates to about 25 to 40 percent of all quit line callers. The problem is that depressed smokers have lower quit rates than non-depressed smokers by a fraction of about 23 to 34 percent. And to date, there's been only one randomized trial that has focused on depressed smokers. You might recall the study presented by Vandermeer here at SRNT in 2009 in Ireland, where she presented a study showing that a seven-call protocol versus a 10-call protocol that added mood management in the 10-call protocol that was, uh, had a higher quit rate than the seven-call. Of course, the problem with that study is that you're confounded by the extra contact time of those three calls, but is what is available in the literature to date. And regarding depression, the research to date suggests there's no increase in depression that's related to smoking cessation. So in summary, depressed smokers make use of quit lines, but there's little data on how effective they are for helping them to quit smoking. And they definitely are quitting at lower rates than non-depressed smokers. So, a potential solution for addressing this problem is acceptance and commitment therapy. In a nutshell, acceptance and commitment therapy is represented by this man who is driving on his motorcycle in a valued direction and he's making room for his baggage, that is his cravings and his depressive thoughts and all the other things that trigger him to smoke. So let me break down what this means. We see here that there's two parts to acceptance and commitment therapy. I'll begin with the first part, the acceptance piece. And what that means is being willing to have your cravings to smoke. And that's not fighting them, but opening up to them, making room for them, trying to make peace with those cravings, letting them come and go on their own. This is also true of depressed mood. You're allowing your depressive thoughts and your depressive sensations to come and go on their own. And there's a whole set of skills that ACT therapists teach on how to be able to be accepting of cravings and of depressive emotions. The second part of ACT is commitment. So the key part here is focusing on your values. That is, what is it that gives your life a sense of purpose and meaning? What is it that's going to dignify the process of quitting smoking even in the presence of feeling depressed and feeling intense cravings? Now, together, the acceptance and commitment is designed to lead to a life-embracing behavior change. Now, you may be wondering, how is this different from a standard program? Well, a standard program would use cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. There are a couple dimensions in which they're different. At a theoretical level, ACT is based on a theory called relational frame theory, and standard CBT is based on standard information processing theories. The approach for handling smoking cues and cravings in ACT is acceptance, and a standard CBT, it's about avoiding those cravings, trying to get rid of them, trying to reduce them. The approach for increasing motivation is focusing on your values in ACT, whereas in CBT, it's about focusing on your reasons for making changes. So it's a logic-based approach. And finally, the methods for training skills in ACT are metaphorical and experiential, in a standard CBT program, they're more literal, logical, and explanatory. So to the trial, what we did here was a subgroup analysis of all participants who were screened depressed 
and who were eligible to be in the main trial. And what that turned out to be is that 60 people were eligible and screen depressed, and of those, 47 were randomized. The allocation was as follows. 24 were to ACT and 23 to CBT. For the follow-up, we see that there was at least 65% follow-up in both arms, which is comparable to the level of follow-up you typically see in a quitline randomized trial. As a pilot trial, the analysis included all available data at six months. And so the aims of this trial were three. First, to look at the receptivity to the intervention, defined as the number of calls that were completed, how satisfied they were with the intervention, and their utilization of nicotine replacement therapy. The second aim was to look at the quit outcome, and our main outcome was the quit outcome at six months post-randomization, and finally to look at the depression outcome. Now looking at the key measures that are relevant to this presentation, we have an, a, the anxiety and depression detector with good sensitivity and specificity. And our cessation outcome was 30-day point prevalence, so no smoking at all in the past 30 days at six months post-randomization. All were offered five calls, so 30 minutes for the first call and 15 minutes for calls two, three, four, and five. This intervention, by the way, was not focused on depression. It was developed for a general population of smokers, and we offered two weeks of the nicotine patch. That's a standard dosage in the South Carolina state quit line at the time of the trial. So we wanted to make this a real-world intervention. That's why it was two weeks. Now looking at the demographics at baseline, we see a very typical demographics for an uninsured quitline caller sample. So the average age was 40, three quarters were female, two thirds were Caucasian, a third were married, a third were working, and about half had a high school education or less. The people who were not Caucasian, primarily they were African American. Regarding AIM-1 on call attempts, we see that on average the CBT uh, intervention had 17 call attempts versus the ACT intervention had 12 call attempts. So more resources needed to be devoted to reaching a participant in CBT than an ACT. In terms of the number of calls completed, there were 2.4 on average for CBT versus 3.4 on average for ACT. So this is an indicator that the ACT participants were more receptive to the intervention than the CBT participants and about half of the ACT participants completed all five calls that were offered versus 9% for CBT. On treatment satisfaction, you'll see here that participants were satisfied with either of the treatments. So whether they were randomized to CBT or ACT, they liked their intervention. The data here suggests that they may have liked it more for ACT, and especially if you look at the bottom in terms of the usefulness of the skills that were offered 92% uh, said they were useful for ACT versus 69% for CBT. Now looking at NRT usage, there was no significant difference in NRT usage, but you'll see here that 77% of the CBT participants reported that they used the NRT that was mailed to them versus 60% for ACT. Looking at AIM-2, the main outcome being the six-month quit rate, we see here that 13% of CBT participants quit smoking versus 33% for ACT, and the p-value was 0.10. Finally, AIM-3. Regarding the depression outcome, at baseline, there were no differences between the two arms on mean levels of depression. However, at the six-month follow-up, the mean score for depression was 4.9 for CBT versus 3.6 for ACT. That's a difference of 1.3. However, the 95% confidence interval does include zero. So in conclusion, there are three points. First is that phone delivered act for depressed smokers does show good receptivity for quitline callers. It has promising quit rates and it shows a potential for lowering depression. What we need now is a fully powered randomized trial of ACT for depressed smokers. Thank you very much. And I'm grateful to my colleague, Dr. Jamie Hefner, who'll be able to field questions about this talk.